millions and millions of them. Millions. And they're, and they're the biggest couples in the world. We have this thing in our family where we don't give away too much and they say, oh, do you have seafood over there? No. Do you have cockles? Oh, no. Anything? Do you, is there anything that grows over there? No. You know, where's mussels? Oh, they're out there at the heads. Oh, we take them, they're over in Pigeon Bay. Can we get cockles? No, nah, none here. Over the other side. Hop over over there, Pigeon Bay. Mussels, are there any mussels around? Nah. Over there or way over there? Not here. My grandmother used to say, here's a piece of bread, go down the beach and, and have your lunch. <laughs> and we thought it was just a natural, th you know, and that's what we did. We only bring people here that we know are gonna be in our lives for a long time that we want to share our place with. Your <laughs> Armai, I don't get to Marae or Puari. Armai, I don't get to Pare Tupana or Tute Hureva. Armai, I don't get to Rohe or Nati Huikai, the Rohe or Terunanga, Akokarata. Noreda, the Natamahi or Nati Huikai, Kia Kwe Kia Kote, Atinakote, Tinakote, Yotata. NATO woman ruled the roost. I gotta admit it. I, I, I'm just a pretty boy amongst all those women. My mother taught us never to turn our back to the sea. I used to say, oh why? And she said, well, anything could happen. You know, we used to have mud sharks here. And turning your back to the sea was actually just disrespectful too. Never take the little ones. Everybody respected the sea because it always provides for us. So we, we know that we need to look after our area so it can continue providing for the future generations. See, they'd, they'd be bigger than um, Otago ones. From your section, right down to the sea, right out, that space, in a sense, belonged to you. So therefore you looked after it, you cleaned it, and you gathered only from there. You looked after it as though it was your own garden. When I was growing up, Mum used to sweep the beach. She had a yard broom, and I think her mother before her used to do that. They would have this big yard broom and sweep along the beach and if they found any plastic or bottles or anything they would pick that up so we learnt that as kids you know walking along the beach if we seen any rubbish we would pick it up and take it home and get rid of it. I wanted to bring a photo of Nairi. She was brought up on that beach. She lived it, she loved it. She was a little, little crawling a round little girl and she'd crawl down there and, and our Callie would go down and he'd crack cockles open for her and she'd eat them raw. We never went hungry as kids. 
we were down the beach having cockles and oysters and mussels and you know, if we got sick of that we could go up the creek and grab a pear and an apple and a peach along the way. There was always quite around us. If I was getting cockles I would feel around in the sand for the cockles with my feet and then I'd pick them out of the, the sand with my feet up to my hands. And if they were too small, we left them behind so they can grow. We have a closed season here on Cockles. Only during the month of September, only on weekends, only by permit, and even by permit you only allow 12 cockles each. That's quite a big restriction considering there were times in which we never overtook them when we were able to. I guess some did, but it wasn't us, like the actual mana whenua of this bay that raped that beach. It was everyone else coming into our bay. We became aware that the cockles were getting fewer and fewer between and smaller. So what we did is we tried to close the bed down, but we couldn't. There was nothing that we had at our disposal to say, no more fishing there. So what we did is we asked the Crown to introduce a piece of legislation. And they introduced a piece of legislation called cockles. And it closed our beds down for about three years and during that time we worked on how we were going to handle it after the, the, the cockle legislation expired. Since then we've introduced Mahinga Ma Tai Tai in the whole bay. There's a, a lot of poaching going on over here. I get rung up to see if I've given a permit for 300 powers or 600 powers, and which I've never, I've never made out a permit for that amount. This black market stuff that happens, they're still going there taking them. And yet the real people are restricted. It's been closed for over 12 years. I mean, to us, because we're getting older, it's a damn long time. And I really felt for him here today when we went down there, because I know that she would love to come down the beach, put her feet in that water to get those cockles. It's been a long time since I've been able to get in the water. And I lived in it. I learned to swim here. I think we all, we're all the best swimmers here because we swim from this wharf to the island, run down the other end, swim home quicker than walking. I prefer all my seafood raw. So with cockles, we'd normally just put them in a pot and boil the jug and tip the hot water over the cockles until they just cracked open ever so slightly and so you can get your knife in and I'd eat them that way. We don't boil the hell out of them. Because <laughs> they do out like rubber. Yep, chuck them in a the bowl, boil the jug, tip it on the top until they just let go, not even let go. Till the water got cold, then tip it off and, and that, that was us. The resource is on a comeback as far as, as far as I could see. So much so that at the last Runaga meeting I suggested to the, to the committee, the, the Runanga committee, that we um, put to the Mātai Tai committee that we open the season up. Just like, darling, you hold your amazing waka. Me? Te waka or what? Our bay is a heartbeat, I think, 
and the thought of not having the kaimoana there is sickening. It's a way of being that has been around for ever and for our people, for that not to be there anymore, would be devastating.